I've started with a preamble that you're already familiar with, since I've already talked about it, because I seem to have been asked the question several times since I started doing these shows. Uh, every time I broach the subject of religion, it's all about how we can reconcile. I know it's a problem for a lot of people. Uh, probably different faiths, I think we must have Muslims in the audience, because we often have Moroccans, Algerians, who come when we do programs on Algeria, Morocco. I know we have Christians too, so there you go. We get people from all walks of life, from all kinds of religions, maybe even some uh, European pagans or something like that. And so people ask in general, what does osteonomy say about religion and can it be reconciled with everything else? So what I always say, and this is why I say it before I do this show, is that nobody should be offended. That when we discern a mechanism, be it a historionomic mechanism or a mechanism of individual and collective psychology, that explains certain religious phenomena we observe, which is normal if we study human phenomena. It obviously has no incidence, no provatoric value normally on the fact that uh, people believe this or that, insofar as if you believe in God, for example, you can consider that it was God who created the world. So naturally all the laws in the world are God's will. So if we can demonstrate all the laws we want, that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. The same goes for the laws of physics and so on. We can do without the God hypothesis, as I don't know who said. I don't know which scientist said I didn't need this hypothesis. I don't know who it was who said that, mathematician, I think, physicist, I think. So uh, we can do without it. We can do without the hypothesis, but... That doesn't mean it invalidates the hypothesis, it just means it's superfluous, it's beside the point or not. There are even certain discourses on God and God's will to hide himself and not impose himself on man. There's even a whole part of theology that explains this, which defends the idea that ultimately it's normal if we can't prove God or that sort of thing. And so in general... Everything that can be said on this subject, and I always insist on this because there are people um, who have uh, naturally, people who don't believe in anything are more inclined to accept explanations that sound materialistic. But what I'm saying is that there are many people who have faith and for that very reason are inclined to feel that any materialistic explanation is an attack on their faith. So some people use it for that, but in doing so they're making a mistake because... Once again, it doesn't prove anything in that sense. So that that's what I wanted to say in a nutshell, so that everyone has an absolutely open mind to what I'm going to say about uh, the mechanisms by which I try to explain in the middle party and above all the vision I have of the religious phenomenon, since you know that there are certain discourses I have on the emergence of political monotheisms, which I'll come back to later, which are also partly conditioned by what I'm about to say. So... Where do my thoughts on this subject come from? Uh, I'm not absolutely sure because I haven't read enough about it yet. I'll have to read up on it, and I'm sure I will, because I think I'll be putting it all in the book on uh, political monotheisms. I'd have to read a lot of books on evolutionary psychology, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'd have to read a lot of books on evolutionary psychology, that sort of thing, uh, on these issues, to get a clear picture, to find out if what I'm saying has already been said, for example, how it's been said, if it's been said better too, which is possible. At this stage, I'm sharing a personal reflection, as it's an idea I'd like to share with you. It's essentially an idea that came to me, and I think there are, from some interactions I've had, that some elements have already been given by authors on the question, but I don't know exactly to what extent, so again, I'll have to look it up. So the beginning of this reflection, in fact, came to me. Uh, I'll take you through the history of how I came to think about it, because as I've already told you, it seems to me the best way to understand where someone's ideas come from and how they got there, this historical farce. It came to me actually a few years ago, 
when I started reading, and I've never finished it, by the way, it's a very imposing book, so I'll have to finish it. But anyway, um, when I started reading Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, the leading economist of the Austrian school, whom you may know, and who, uh, at the beginning of his book entitled Human Action, uh, wonders about human action and indicates in particular, uh, so I say this from memory, because it's quite far from the theme, but I remembered elements, at least the way I lost them, that initiated my thinking. In particular, he mentions the fact that it's thanks to information that men act, because men, depending on the information they receive, will make choices, will take decisions, and act only if they are sufficiently informed to identify the possible consequences of their actions and therefore act accordingly to obtain such consequences. And with this idea, I don't know whether it's explicit or not, that men who would be in a totally undecided, indeterminate environment would have to act accordingly uncertain environment, impossible to foresee any consequences, would remain inactive, remain inactive for want of being able to do anything, something. And in fact, my thoughts on religion in general grew out of this. Why is that? Because, because very often we see that man is powerless that he has no means of achieving anything, so it's as if he's in an environment in which he has no control over anything, no certainty about anything, no consequential vision of anything. But he'll start to act anyway. And he's going to act in a way that makes sense, irrationality, but which has its own rationality. And I'll come back to this of religious behavior, which is generally sacrificial behavior. and essentially bargaining behavior. That's where it gets interesting, and that's why it comes to me from Mises, because he basically evokes in the action he's dealing with economic action, i.e. the fact that man is going to act with the aim of obtaining economic results that he will trade on a market in the hope of the consequences and so on. And so uh, knowing the rules of exchange, knowing roughly speaking the price system, the value of things, and therefore knowing whether he's going to win or lose an exchange that's about to take place, engaged in. And in the end, in the most primitive, uh, or at least the most self-interested way of thinking about religion, that's the help you're looking for. That's basically what you're doing. You engage in a bargaining process where you're ready to trade something for something else. But it's a bargaining process that's totally fictional in a way. Fictional in a way, since in reality, in reality, the information you have shows you that there's nothing you can do. For example, if you have someone close to you who is ill, perhaps you've all had a serious accident or a very serious illness, which results in a disease, I don't know, a stroke or something like that, and you end up in hospital and you can't do anything, you just have to wait, you don't understand what's going on, you don't know because you have no medical skills, you wait, things are explained to you but you only half understand, so you don't know what you can do. And it's at times like these that many people turn to religion to pray that their loved one will be healed, that sort of thing. And one of the classic reflexes of prayer is that it's a form of bargaining, since you're going to give up time to invest yourself, putting some kind of commitment into something. Hoping... Uh, from the divinity you're addressing, a return. In other words, you have a bargaining reflex, reflex equivalent to the one you would have in any other context, to solve problems, ask for someone's help, fetch resources, and so on. So you have the same reflex, but since you can't put it into practice, you're in a system where you're powerless, where you have no one to turn to, you imagine an interlocutor 
to whom you will present your requests and you imagine a whole process of alternative bargaining with him. And uh, based on this, it's generally a behavior that will calm you down because you feel you're doing something. So that was the starting point for, for my thinking, starting with Baizes and uh, the question of haggling. And then I thought a little bit more beyond that. And as I pursued this line of thought, simply by taking it a step further, I came to the conclusion that, generally speaking, it showed that it wasn't just the question of bargaining that was at stake, but that bargaining itself was the effect, the system of exchange that takes place between human beings. It was the effect of heuristics that had been put in place in the brains of human beings. In other words, a way of dealing with problems. In other words, when, when uh, we're in a situation, well, any problem you encounter, your solution, as we're a social animal, will essentially be to look for it in other human beings, in other conscious beings. So once again, I repeat, you look for someone who has the resources you need to exchange them with, and so on. Or if you're faced with an environment, you look for a solution as soon as a problem arises. A solution, as soon as you're faced with a problem, you're going to look for a solution, and you're going to find it. You need a hole for shelter, so you dig one, and so on. These simple things are simple mechanisms that go down... Uh, if you throw a piece of bread, a peanut, anything, and it falls outside the cage, they'll have the reflex to look for it, to try to catch it with their hand. Uh, and if they don't succeed, they'll look for a stick to pull with. All these are pre-programmed heuristics in the brain, problem-solving modes. that make you look for a solution. Your brain analyzes whether the solution is good and feasible. If it looks good and feasible, it waits for it. For example, if the basic solution is to catch with the hand, it will try. And once he realizes that it's not feasible, he looks for an alternative solution. He searches and then he sees the stick. He looks for the stick, he tests, and so on. So it's calculation processes like this, in fact, that take place in the brain, where the brain imagines a solution, generally the simplest possible one, tests it, if it succeeds, so much the better. If it fails, it imagines another solution, tests it, etc., until it comes up with the right one. This is in normal calm times. When you're in a stressful situation, this process goes even faster. Situation. Because when you're in a situation of threat, when you're in a situation of danger, either where your life is in danger or where the life of someone else is in danger. Let me take the example. You don't know what's going on. You can't do anything. You just have to wait. In spite of everything, your organism, your brain, your body in general is made for it. In a stressful situation, put itself in a position to solve a problem, and if possible, to solve an urgent problem. I'm not a great expert on physiology, uh, on the biology of the human body, but it seems to me that the hormone, hormone, I don't even know if it's a hormone, the substance secreted by your body that's most... I don't even know if it's a hormone, uh, the substance secreted by your body that's uh, best known in stress situations is adrenaline, which increases your heart rate, puts you under stress and makes you think much faster. That's why when you have an accident or something, you often feel that time is slowing down because in fact your brain takes a shot and goes into overdrive. So when you're in a stressful situation, your body and brain launch this process of putting you into a state of emergency so that this process I was talking about of parity in the search for a solution goes much faster. And so when you're in a very stressful situation, that's what happens. And so your brain basically works until it finds a solution. So in most problems, it's fine because you quickly find a solution. Once you found the solution, you gradually come out of your state of stress, and that's fine. The problem is that this mechanism which is obviously beneficial, because if you didn't have it, if we didn't have it, our species would probably have been unable to survive 
a certain number of dangers. So it's an evolutionary advantage. But it's an evolutionary advantage that also has its disadvantage, which is that it puts the organism under constraints and it puts you at risk a certain number of things cardiac arrest that sort of thing so there's a health risk to the reaction itself and so to prevent this reaction from lasting too long you have to realize as you've probably already done, that when you're under stress, if there's only one thing you want, it's to stop being under stress. Because it's painful, quite simply, physically. Before an oral, you feel like jibber-jabbering, you feel like going to the toilet, you're like that, you get up because you can't sit still, because you've got to do something one way or another. One way or another. So this tension in which your body finds itself is associated at the same time with an urgent need to find a solution to put an end to this state as quickly as possible, naturally, to preserve your body too. So both are associated. So in most situations, it's fine and healthy. Where it causes problems, particularly for human beings, no doubt, is in the stressful situations. I was talking about uh, an of total helplessness, a where your brain is going to turn, but it's going to turn in a vacuum because, in fact, it doesn't understand what's going on or it doesn't know. It has information briefs, but you know you're powerless. Because, you know, there are some operating theatres where you can do absolutely nothing. You can get up, you can run around trying to pace yourself, you can go outside for a smoke to try to calm yourself down, to lower your blood pressure, but that doesn't solve the problem. The only thing that will calm you down is to find a solution to the problem or an apparent solution to the problem because it's only once you've found the solution that your body comes out of this state of stress. Because finally the brain sends the signal that, well, we've found it, we're doing something about it. That's why, in general, when you're stressed about going on a trip, it's only once you've set off that you start to feel better. Or when you're stressed because you're going to take an oral, all you have to do is start taking your exam for it to stop, because being in action and get out of the state, or at least exploit it in the right way, so that it doesn't put you in a difficult situation. Situation. So what's religion got to do with it? Well, in my opinion, these stressful situations, where there's absolutely nothing you can do, naturally push the brain. Uh, once it's looked for all the solutions, it can't, i.e. it's already trying to see if it can cure the person. No, it can't. It sees if there's anything to be done with the doctors, and there's nothing to be done. And once you've exhausted everything, your brain naturally continues its search for a solution. So where does it naturally go? It goes for all the most obvious heuristics at its disposal, i.e. the means with which it generally solves problems. Quite simply, every time you're faced with a problem, your brain immediately thinks of the solutions you already know. You try to invent other solutions when none of the ones you already know seem satisfactory. That seems satisfactory. And so I think that's why uh, in these cases, human beings naturally, after trying to uh, think of everything they can do themselves, turn to the usual uh, solution, which is the solution of others, the solution of the world. Social solution, i.e. to go and talk to someone Except that here too, you talk to your loved ones who are waiting for the guy, and while the guy is sick, they can't do anything either. You've talked to the doctor who tells you two things, but from there you can't do any more. So there may be people who can be calmed down by that, but what's important is that there's at least one part of the population that's going to go all the way with the reasoning, and I'll come back to that later. But there are others who continue to think, and naturally this leads them to the usual logic of bargaining, and this logic of bargaining, I think, is when it becomes embodied in the way I was saying before. And in particular, if we go back to primitive man, i.e. before we even imagine divinity, etc. It's embodied in the fact that usually to solve a problem, you have to make an effort. There's something that costs, and in the end, it leads to a solution. And uh, simply, if you get up and start running around, you know it's not going to work. 
So in reality, what we're being led to do is to create a kind of alternative fictional framework, a kind of alternative reality, if you like, in which the action you might normally take to solve a problem, but which would be totally impotent, would be effective. I uh, I don't know, you're going to starve yourself or that sort of thing to get someone else cured in a system of normal logic, logic of empirical reality that, you know, naturally it doesn't work and the problem is insoluble. But uh, if you imagine the existence of a force, a divinity, whatever, that's capable of accepting the sacrifice you're about to make, or the request you're going to make by investing in it, which is a form of sacrifice anyway, to accept this, and in exchange to give you the effect you're expecting, i.e. to care for your loved one, etc., through this mechanism you manage, through fiction, to get around reality as it appears empirically. And what's ultimately very interesting is that by self-conviction of a form of reality, of that thought, you will obtain the appeasement that you normally get by actually doing something about it. Hence the calming aspect for individuals of a large part of religious practice, whether it's uh, lighting a candle, taking part in a procession, saying a long prayer, etc. It has the effect of putting you into an action that's supposed to give you a result. In other words, it follows the normal channels of your brain and the way evolution has wired you. In a situation where normally you could do absolutely nothing, the situation of absence of information or of information that shows you to be powerless, as was the one I started from, in fact. In effect, and that's what allows you to find yourself in a form of calm and equilibrium. And that, I think, is the basic thing. Of course, the solution is only imaginary. So what makes it possible? Because, of course, if you pray and say, I'll be all right, and then the person dies, it obviously has no effect. Your observable reality shows you otherwise. And in the vast majority of cases, this will indeed be the case. You can pray all you like, but it won't solve anything. But uh, uh, it's extremely interesting because what I'm talking about here isn't just what's happening today to people who find themselves in a waiting room. I'm telling you this to show you how these things feel emotionally. Uh, now I ask you to put yourself back in the position of a primitive society, a very primitive society, where religious feeling didn't yet exist. But where this type of functioning and this type of stress were beginning to arrive. So, you can imagine other things. There's someone's illness. There's also, for example, that of... There's the problem of not having enough food. A lack of food. You... know that you can't control the weather since, for example, you only spend on crops, you can't go hunting because there are no animals left, etc. in a famine situation. So you can also do this to make it rain. It comes back, it's the same thing. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's applicable to absolutely everything, to relieve the stress you create in the situation. But sometimes the rain will fall after you've done that. And sometimes the guy you prayed for will get better. And so, in these cases, for people who have found themselves in this situation, it's always the same. Our heuristics guide us to the result of the action they've taken, and this will validate the thing for them. And the fact is, in all likelihood, for them, the reflex will take hold in stressful situations. If they're in a stressful situation again, they'll resort to that trick again. And that's when another mechanism comes into play, which is uh, what we might call the martingale mechanism, or beginner's luck if you like, which is also an extremely human uh, phenomenon. 
Uh, you must know this if you've ever played a game, for example, and I think it happens a lot to people who have... I think this happens a lot to people who have tried to play casino games or more recently the stock market. Often you're lucky at first, and in fact the luck of your initial experience will often condition your relationship with it. In other words, if you... I don't know, in the first two days you're trading, you make over 40% like that with a series of absolutely mind-boggling strokes of luck. It's going to give rise to a kind of addiction due to the certainty that it's easy and it's possible and not that you've had a stroke of luck because you're going to tell yourself that it's not statistically possible. And so you're going to want to try again. You might lose a lot before you give up completely. You might lose 10 times, 20 times what you won the first time before you manage to get rid of the idea that it's possible. In fact, no, it's not possible because you've really had a stroke of luck. In fact, the first time you stumbled upon a stroke of luck, it was a stroke of luck, however improbable it may seem. And so the same thing happens. If you're in this behavior of resolving stress through some form of prayer and you get the result, It engages you to believe, and often to believe in such a way that you'll need a whole bunch of negative experiences behind you to make it go away. So that's the first thing. That's what's going to allow the practice to take hold. Because what's more, the people who have immediate negative feedback and so won't necessarily be led to believe in the thing, they're not going to develop something that can triumph culturally. Let me explain. Those who have come to believe in something the day they have a problem or their neighbor has a problem, they'll come and sell them the same solution. Saying, if you can't do anything, you can try this. You can go and light a candle, do whatever you want. I don't know. And so culturally, there's going to be a diffusion effect because you're going to give someone else who's under stress a turnkey system to get them out of their stressful situation. So they'll adopt it. And that's how the thing multiplies. Conversely, those for whom it doesn't work if they ever say to someone in a stressful situation, don't do it, it's useless, it doesn't work, they don't solve anything. They maintain the state in which he's powerless. And so the other person keeps on trying to find a solution to his problem. So it's not in line with nature's heuristics to impose his own solution. So naturally, the strongest solution will tend to prevail. And this solution is that you can resort to a kind of alternative logic By resorting to the action of a deity, when you don't have an obvious action, you can do it yourself with a certain and immediate result. Immediate result. And uh, conversely, a whole culture of explaining why things don't work sometimes develops. And so you're going to attribute to the divinity a certain number of parameters, personalities that are like the neighbors. And so you're going to say that sometimes uh, the divinity isn't happy because you haven't done enough and so on. So I think that's why cults of this kind are gradually appearing. In addition, there's something else to which this thing is adapted. In addition to the occasional stressful situations to which you may be confronted, you have, in particular, as man becomes increasingly aware of his own mortality, and then existential questions such as, what am I doing here? Why am I here? And so on. You will experience a form of diffuse stress caused by this. Not the same kind of emergency stress, but one that can cause the same psychological pain. Because you wake up, you're afraid of dying, you're afraid that the people around you will die, you're afraid you'll never see them again, and so on. You regularly have people in your life who have died and whom you no longer see and think about, you grieve. And your brain is also put in the situation of, I can't do anything for them, I can't do anything for them, I can't help them, will I ever see them again, and so on. And so if you have a solution that has already emerged culturally for small occasional problems, naturally by extension you're going to resort to that too, with the idea that the people you loved are no longer there, but they are somewhere, and so you can perhaps help them to live where they are. There's the part where you bury them with food, that can be one thing, but then a whole bunch of things, saying prayers for them and so on, remembrance, whatever you want. And uh, it's also part of the same thing, which is that it's also a mechanism to combat stressful situations. So naturally, it's an advantage because it allows you 
manage a whole host of psychological distress without which we would be as relatively intelligent beings, at least as social animals with a certain level of intelligence. These would be problems we'd have absolutely no way of solving otherwise. And so my vision of the origin of the religious phenomenon itself, i.e. the initial imagination of the existence of an external force, which can be used to circumvent situations of powerlessness, is what seems to me the most well-founded explanation in the natural mechanisms of the human brain. To me, that's how it works. So that's, shall we say, the fundamental idea I have uh, of the way religious feeling unfolds and appears in an animal, a primate, like the human being, now, why is this historianomically interesting? Because I think I've already mentioned it, in particular in the program I did uh, a long time ago on Radio Athena on uh, political monotheisms. I don't know if I've talked about it much since. Is that all the great political monotheisms, ancient Judaism, Islam, Christianity, let's say, in its Constantinian version, that is to say... These are religions with a very strong social component. With a very strong social component, i.e. they will have a structuring effect, not just be a matter of personal faith. There's a big difference between Christianity as it developed in the first centuries, which was really more a matter of personal faith, salvation and so on, and Christianity as it developed from Constantine onwards, which was to be a Christianity with functions of organization and social ordering, so there's another use for it, and what's really interesting is that it's precisely these political monotheisms that are aimed at social organization. All these political monotheisms appear in societies that are under a great deal of stress, and in which previous religious culture has been completely discredited. In other words, as I was saying earlier, you need a lot of experience to get any religious belief out of you. Or any belief of our type, for that matter. If you've adhered to it, you'll need several experiences to get out of it. because there is a whole emotional aspect to human intelligence. There are things you're convinced of with the help of an emotion that engraves it in you, and you don't just have to get rid of the reasoning, you have to get rid of the emotion at the same time as you get rid of the idea. So it gets complicated, as is the case with many religious beliefs. But for example, when you're in a situation, particularly one of emotional collapse or civilizational collapse, As I talked about some time ago, I think it was the last private live I did on this subject on justice and phases of civilizational collapse. It's in these phases of civilizational collapse that the great religions appear. Uh, why is that? Because it's in these phases of civilizational collapse that previous religious systems have collapsed. Lost all credibility. Why is this? Because when you enter a long period of decline where things are going to get worse and worse, for a while, you'll have people saying it's because we didn't have enough faith, we didn't make enough sacrifices, etc. So they're going to make more and more sacrifices. So they're going to do more and more. They're going to try to solve the problem, except that the problem is never solved. Solved, so after a while, uh, this has the effect of losing faith on a social scale where a faith, uh, whatever it may be, ends up being relatively discredited by a large part of the population. And so when you find yourself in another stressful situation and stress on a social scale with problems of barbarian invasion, famine, plague, as there was the Justinian plague, for example, well, uh, in this system you find yourself in the initial situation of the birth of religion, which is when you're faced with a problem individually and collectively, and you... You're totally powerless to solve it because you no longer have the usual springboard that you have developed culturally, which was the religious springboard. And so the natural reflex in such cases is to put back in place a whole religious system, a whole belief system, which is likely to produce some good results.
And so it's not for nothing that I say that what characterizes political monotheism is that it's generally born in a kind of cultural broth where all the old points of reference have been discredited. So there is no longer a dominant faith. Uh, and in this kind of cultural melting pot, you're going to have a whole host of prophetic figures appearing in the same cultural space. In the same cultural space, so roughly speaking, they're all saying the same thing. But uh, in the midst of these people, little by little, you're going to have one who stands out from the crowd, because political monotheism in general is warlike from the outset, whether you take Muhammad, Moses, or Constantine. What characterizes them is that they are warriors who took their faith as a standard and began to win victories. And the more victories they rack up, the more they find themselves in the situation of the guy who once again plays Kiborsi code for the first time and gets validation because it works, and so something is born. And what characterizes these people is that they have one success, two successes, three military successes, each time blaming it on the faith they're defending, and that allows this faith to impose itself as a kind of new social cement and as the thing that will allow them to get out. Because unlike the old faith, this one seems to be effective, since it gets results. So it's got to be the thing that reorders the social body. And that's why you have these religions that are very social, that appear in these big stressful situations. And like, uh, in general, they appear at the trough, really at the bottom of the wave. Prophets like that who appear at the bottom of the wave are likely to benefit from the fact that we'll come out of it a little, that we'll succeed in re-establishing a semblance of order, that we'll have a sort of a sort of small renaissance, let's say, of the economy and uh, all that sort of thing. And that's going to create another dynamic which will then uh, generally lead to success. Uh, it lasts for a few decades, but that's enough to revive the movement for a thousand years or more because of the initial mass of successes. And then we'll come, we'll have to come to a new time of a relatively prolonged and hard decline for this religion to be discredited once again and for another religion to reappear on the back of it all. So I, I really think that's what's interesting and that the fact that all these religions, uh, these great political atheist religions, once again in their political aspect, have emerged in situations of civilizational collapse Mosaicism appeared in the civilizational collapse of the Bronze Age in the 11th century BC. Constantinian Christianity and Islam emerged as part of the collapse or pre-collapse of the Roman Empire. The first collapse, let's say, of the 3rd century of the Roman Empire and then of the two empires, Byzantine and Sassanid, which plunged religion into relative economic chaos. And so it's likely, and this is why I also speak of the probable advent of a neo-Islam or this kind of thing in the future situation, that with depopulation, decivilization, etc., we'll once again find ourselves in a situation where there'll be a whole bunch of old, old religious conceptions that will be replaced by new ones. Old religious conceptions that will be swept away, that will be forgotten. And so it opens up a space for new forms of religiosity, new forms of religiosity like that. So that's that's my vision of the thing and what I find interesting. So once again, I have to, if you have any tips on this, any ideas, don't hesitate to let me know in the comments or right now on the chat. I'll say it in the comments for people who come to see the show afterwards. I'm interested because I'll need them to compile my bibliography for this book. But what I find extremely interesting is that it links the logic of appearance the logic of the emergence of this religious fact on the scale of small groups and even individuals of this religious fact are that of the appearance on a large scale which ultimately has exactly the same cause, i.e. a particular stress situation that we try to remedy by finding a system that allows us to think it through, to find solutions that are not materially possible to achieve, not materially attainable. So there you have it. That's the starting point for my thinking. That's the way I see this religious fact at present, historionomically at least. But I think it's a good start.